Matt Belazic. I am a postdoc researcher at Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, I've been working with sturgeon for seven years now uh, on the James River. You gotta realize these fish have gone through mega volcanoes and uh, meteorites, the things that killed dinosaurs. These fish have survived. My name is Albert Spells. I'm the Virginia Fisheries Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, located in Charles City, Virginia. Uh, without sturgeon, I probably would not be talking to you in English today. My name is Cyrus Brame. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm the wildlife refuge specialist there. It's helping to, to recover a species. We're, we're going to do what we can to help that. Uh, my name is Ann Wright and I am the coordinator of Life Sciences Outreach Education and I'm also an assistant professor in the biology department at VCU. We are able to begin to track the fish as it moved upriver. Matt called, just, just frantic one day, So you need to come over here. You know, so Mike and I and, and Cyrus, we, 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 we get in the vehicle and we run over and take a boat over to the island. He had this about eight foot fish. I'd seen eight foot fish before, but it was dead. I'd never seen a live one. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, uh, many didn't believe we had Atlantic sturgeon in that river anymore. We knew historically we did. It's clearly cited in some of the uh, early records of European settlements uh, tied to Jamestown. But as those years progressed, the populations declined to the point where it's, they, they weren't evident. No. During the dying times, when uh, at least 50% of the colonists died, getting ready to go back to England, uh, one of the things that sustained them was sturgeon. Around 1850, a lot of people came over from Germany and Russia and they had experience with uh, beluga sturgeon and sturgeon over in Europe. So they started to process it over here and that's when the fishery took off. And by early, like 1900, the population along the whole coast had crashed. Due to overfishing and habitat loss, the uh, population just appeared to plummet just based on catch rates. And it's really never recovered un until now, when we start to look at it, it's, it's quite apparent that, at least on the James River, that the, the population is at worst stable. Virginia was very proactive. We were the first state to put in a state moratorium in 1974. And that's protected the fish while they were here, but if the fish were up in New York or down in the Carolinas, they could get caught there. And then in 1998, the ASMFC put in a moratorium along the all U.S. waters, and that was when the fish was truly protected. And I think because of that forward-looking um, effort back in 1974 is one of the reasons that we may have one of the healthiest populations along the coast, because we, uh, we protected the few fish that were, were here. The fish is listed. In, as, as endangered and uh, we coordinate the permitting activities on, on the, the permit that we have for the Chesapeake Bay uh, to collect sturgeon. In 2010 I was awarded a three-year grant from the NOAA Be Wet program, the Bay Watershed Education and Training for Teachers. The point was to set up real-time monitoring and track the migration of anadromous fish, particularly sturgeon and the American shad. We were able to purchase a global satellite receiver, standalone satellite receiver, and place it in the James River. And this receiver picks up pings from acoustic tags that are inserted into fish and sends you an email when that fish is picked up. 42633. We have tracked fish to New Jersey. We've tracked fish to the Savannah River in Georgia. Atlantic sturgeon may, may winter off the coast of Virginia and, and North Carolina. So we're learning more. There's so much more to learn. 
over the week it compiles a, a list of all of the tags that it has picked up and sends you at the end of the week a data file. That was the first of these receivers that's been put out within North America. So we are able to begin to track the fish as it moved upriver. And frankly, on the Chesapeake Bay, Matt Belazic may have been the first person to do a directed study uh, of sturgeon. There's been other projects, and most of those projects were fisheries dependent. Matt may have been the first to do a fishery independent study on, on the Chesapeake Bay. This is what the real-time piece of it was. Um, the notifications would be sent to you as that fish moved by. You would, oh, 16091, back in the river this year. Oh, oh, he's on, he's on. There's a fish in there. Grab him. Uh, to catch the fish, we just use gill nets. That's the only way to do it. That's why a lot of people don't work with them because it's, it's, uh, it's tough work. We know we have uh, Atlantic sturgeon from all over coming into the James River. We get fish from the Hudson River and the Delaware River quite often. Uh, so we, 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 we are learning that this is important. We cannot manage sturgeon based on a single river system. It has to be a coastal management. We've gotten lots of information from where sturgeon are breaching on different rivers from the Pamunkey, the York, I think the Rappahannock, um, Appomattox, James. At the end of this three-year period, Matt has gotten out 27 tags and the data from these tags are being used by teachers and students throughout the James River watershed. The research that's been generated from their work has gone a long way to helping support uh, a recovery effort for this prehistoric species. But to see those fish uh, uh, growing that large tells me that, you know, we're doing something right. The fish are surviving uh, to that age, and we're seeing smaller fish. Uh, if we can improve spawning habitat, uh, we can improve the, the rate of recovery of, of the animal here in, in the James River.